Good afternoon and welcome to the Pulse here on the Joy News channel. Now coming up this hour, the Ghana Medical Association describes as alarming the increase in number of practitioners leaving the country as they say well-experienced specialists are now joining the list, leaving huge gaps in the sector. Um, brain drain in the health sector is no brainer. We are losing our nurses, we are losing our doctors and um, in the past we used to lose quite young people who probably have just started work and so forth. Now we are losing even specialists. More as they call for the economy to be fixed to forestall further brain drain. Also coming up, number of Ghanaians seeking to enter the United States of America shoot up by 300%. The embassy in Accra says the high numbers are stripped available resources to process visa applications speedily. We'll also uh, tell you about suspension of new application uh, for 10 days this month. And we'll have our usual Friday conversation, Shaping Ghana, today. Uh, this show is live on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 125. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and also myjoyonline.com for these and more. It's a very wonderful day for us and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the show. My name is Samuel Kojo Brace. Please do stay. Well, let's start off. Uh, from the medical doctors because the Ghana Medical Association is this afternoon describing as alarming the level of brain drain in the medical sector. According to president of the association, Dr. Frank Serebo, the medical sector is now losing more experienced specialists to brain drain. Speaking at the annual general meeting of the Society of Private Medical and Dental Practitioners, Dr. Serebo charged the government to fix what he says is responsible for the exodus of medical professionals, including the depreciating city, high cost of living, among others. Um, brain drain in the health sector is no brainer. We are losing our nurses, we are losing our doctors. And um, in the past, we used to lose quite young people who probably have just started work and so forth. Now we are losing even specialists. We are leaving, consultants are leaving. Um, nurses, well-trained nurses, nurses that you don't expect to leave are living. And even we are even creating the situation where we have a backlog of health professionals who don't know what to do. So the next thing is that they have to leave. So for us to talk of a brain gain, for me, is very important because it's just like a train wreck. We all see it coming. We can predict its angles and we know it is coming and yet we are not doing anything to stop it. And for us to be able to stop this, we actually will have to do a lot of thinking, and we have to do a lot of soul searching, and we have to form some kind of a mindset that is very important and critical in this direction. But the issues are clear. Whether we like it or not, the number one driver of brain drain is actually economics. So if we don't do anything about our economic situation in this country, and we don't check how this country is progressing in terms of our depreciation of our city, our unemployment status, the kind of things that are happening regarding the economy, we would have to suffer. And I just heard um, the President of the Pharmaceutical Society talk about the fact that even health insurance how is it differentiating between the public and the private sector in order to be able to help you achieve this important dream that you have? I even believe that we should be thinking of brain retention before we even think of brain gain, because the retention is even a problem. How much more to gain? And if you look at the push and pull factors, you need to even establish equilibrium before you can begin to even look at your ability to pull others to come in. I see the private sector as a strategic um, partner in, in this fight. And that is why I believe that you play a key role to be able to 
help us arrest this brain drain, one, before we even think of brain gain. But my members who at least even come to you to do locums, your payment, they say it's not good. <laughs> so how do you intend to help them to stay? And um, some of you who are even on your own, it's difficult, and I appreciate the difficulty that there are times you, you need to fall on some level of lower cadre of staff to be able to man your facilities, otherwise you run into trouble, because you can't pay. So we need to look at all of this. We have to forge strategic partnership to ensure that our facilities also match the level of any public institution in a way. If we are not able to do that, we are in trouble. Now joining us for a conversation on this is Perpetual Fori Amanfo, who is president of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association. Also, Dr. Richard S. Selome, he's general secretary of the Medical Association. Uh, Dr. Med Andri Kwesi Kuma, president of the Society of Private Medical Practitioners. And uh, we also have AJ Carbon, who is president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, uh, NAGRAT. And, uh, we will be having a labor expert as well to have a chat with on this. Uh, let, let me start with you, uh, Madam Perpetual. Now, uh, so so we'll, 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 we'll get down and, and really deal with all of, all of these. But uh, uh, let, let me start with you, uh, Richard, uh, and, 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 and try to let us understand. Is this all down to the economy or there are some other factors that we are not being told about? Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, as my president said, mm. um, a larger chunk of this is the economic milieu in which we work. Um, take, for instance, uh, the work you do, the stresses that come with it, the risks that go with it, mm. and then the compensation that goes with it. Mm. Mm. And the typical doctor, I doubt, is able to even walk into a showroom to buy a brand new car most of us would have to purchase some second-hand car of sorts. In recent times, if you are lucky, you get some uh, high purchase scheme, which if you are lucky and your monthly deductions are able to hold, then mm. you can take care of that. Mm. Mm. Uh, majority of health workers find it really tough in this country. And I'm sure GRNMA will speak regarding the nurses. But this is tough because of the economic situation in which we work. And the society also perceives you to be the creme de la creme and so yeah. expect you. Yeah. I believe all the, those on this panel have been on church committees, chairmen for various occasions, everything you have been invited. And there's places a lot of burden on you. So the economic situation is a very key factor when it comes to this, because you definitely have to live to let live. Beyond that is also career fulfillment issues. Okay. People are posted to areas where they work. I work in a half medium. The road is bad. Amenities there, like good schools for your children and etc., are not available. Your colleagues are staying in the cities or your colleagues have traveled out of the country. You begin to ask yourself questions. Why are you staying here? And why are you risking your life to do all of these things? Mm -hmm. And so the amenities are also there. Career fulfillment, you go to work, you don't have the tools to work, Sometimes patients die in your hand when you know you have the skills, you have the requisite knowledge, but the things are not there. And so sometimes at work you get depressed, you are stressed by the work that you do, and you feel like the system is such that it is even working against you in some occasions. And so people begin to ask themselves questions. And then they ask themselves, are there no other places where I can work where I get relatively better remuneration, mm -hmm. and then relatively better working conditions, mm -hmm. and then also relatively better uh, amenities so that myself, my family can live in a comfortable way after all the stressful sacrifices I make for my career. And so there are, there are many other side issues that join in, but the economy plays a very big role. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just end by saying this. I mean, um, as our president has always said, if you actually were to work your salary in dollar terms, generally, for most workers, even though from how many years ago when I started working, they were almost earning uh, about $1,000 if you wanted to convert one is to one or something. 
But today that I've been a specialist of almost seven years standing, it's actually less than that per capita. So your buying power, your purchasing power has reduced through no fault of yours, even though some attempts have been made to improve your your salary and the, uh, uh, the package. So you said a, 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 a less than a less than a thousand dollars. Most doctors who are starting work today as a medical officer earn less than a thousand dollars on a month to month basis. Mm. And even specialists just barely either make that or less, just slightly less than a thousand dollars. Putting everything together. If you use only basic salary, then it's even worse. Oh, so you mean that a specialist does not earn, if you convert it, even more than a 15,000 cities a month? Of course. Oh. Okay. And so, mm. how do you expect that specialist to stay if he just crosses a six hour journey to UK or maybe a seven to eight hour journey to the States or Canada? And all of a sudden, he's earning six, seven, eight times of that. How do you stop that person from going? Remember, it is within his rights mm. uh, to go and serve human beings everywhere in the world anyway. And that is why those who remain, we must make an effort to ensure that they stay, at least whilst they are here, they have a decent keep to, to at least take care of themselves and then their families for the risks and the efforts that they put in. Mm. So and let's go over the numbers again. How many specialists have we lost? And, and how many general practitioners have we lost as a country? Well, um, I, I, I may not have the data here. And the challenge also is that mm -hmm. we can use only proxy data for this. The Medical and Dental Council tells us that on a month-to-month -month basis, between 100 and 120 doctors are asking for what we call certificate of good standing to enable them travel abroad. Mm. Out of this, you are having about 20 to 30 people who are specialists and are going. What's even alarming is the fact that many of the countries that they used to go and have challenges integrating because the countries had stringent measures where you have to go back and do start your specialization again if you wanted to license there, are now removing some of these barriers. Mm. Recently, Canada has removed some of them. Some states in the U.S. have started. And the UK itself has also begun taking away some of these barriers for you. So you, you can live easier as a specialist these days. And so it's even more worrying for us now, for specialists. Remember, recently one specialist left a district. And that is the only specialist in obstet uh, obst uh, obstetrician gynecologist in that area. Mm. And that has serious implications for, for obstetric care, maternal mortality issues, et cetera. And I'm sure the nursing fraternity also yeah. share their bits. I'm sure you see how alarming this mm. issue is. What this means is that we may have the facilities, you may have money to, to attend to the best of medical care, but we may not have the specialists to take care of you in, in, the, in this country. Yep. The Agenda 111 hospitals are a beautiful dream, but human beings, health professionals need to manage to make it what they are. And for where we are going, where we intend to bring specialized services and other healthcare services as mm. close as possible to the people to reduce their indirect cost of traveling, finding places to stay and others. The important thing is that we must retain the specialists, we must retain the other health workers, we must retain all these people, not just only specialists, but all the health workers, nurses, doctors, uh, uh, pharmacists, laboratory specialists, etc., across the country, so that people don't have to still be journeying to Kolebu Konfanochi uh, to get the care, specialist care that they need to get. So, without them, mm -hmm. uh, the facilities will be beautiful, but you can't have full function of them. And I'm sure you've seen that even in UGMC, where we have a huge edifice that's supposed to serve quaternary services. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have the full complement of consultants, specialists of various skills, doctors, nurses, and co, not all the services are running at full steam. And this, I must say, in as much as health services are being hampered, we should also be thinking about the fact that health services are not just some beneficial for the Christmas services that we render, but they also help to bring us foreign exchange. People in the sub-region travel in to consult for specialist services, a specialist within the country. And so if we put this right, invest in health human resource, we will be able to attract even foreign exchange into the country. And that also helps to improve the economy 
as well as even stabilize our currency. So mm. it's important we pay attention to this brain drain matter. Mm. Quite interesting to hear that as a doctor, you take home, sometimes might not be close to 15,000. Uh, you know. Let me summarize it for you. Your take home cannot take you home. That's the simplest way to put it. <laughs> I'm sure Perpetual agrees with me. He, she does. She <laughs> does. Because I, I heard her smile there. Uh, Perpetual <laughs> Boyama, for, uh, thank you for, for joining us here. She is president of the Registered Nurses and Midwives Association. So, uh, I mean, some time ago, you, there, there were some numbers that were put out there as numbers of doctor nurses who are leaving the country. Uh, where does that number stand now? Thank you very much and greetings to all your listeners. The name is Perpetual Furi Ampofu. I think I heard you say Amanfu or something. Okay. It's okay. Ampofu. Thank you. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you very thank you very much. So in terms of the average numbers of mm. nurses and midwives trying to move abroad, it, mm. it stands at an average of about five hundred a month who actually put in their the documents for verification of their licenses with the Nursing and Midwifery Council. So it is the, the immigration is still on. Our colleagues are moving out. Our employers, that is the Ministry of Health and its agencies, the largest agency being the Ghana Health Service, mm -hmm. um, including the teaching hospitals and the child institutions will tell you. There are gaps that are being created by the movement of our colleagues Mm. and it has impact on the care and the safety that is needed for both the patient and for the health professional. Because mm. mind you, when you have gaps in the staffing levels and the workload increases, it puts the health professional at a place where the individual can be bent out. When the individual is bent out, it has impact on the care the person is given, decisions mm that need to be taken, and there is always that room for medical error. So it's important that at any point in time we have um, enough of our health professionals to mm. care when it comes to nursing and midwifery, that we have the, the requisite um, numbers in, for care at the various levels of the health system. Mm. Mm. So out of these 500 nurses who apply per month, how many eventually do get the permission to travel out? I don't have that data with me, mm -hmm. but um, it's just a matter of time. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, once they complete the process of their verification, they will move out. Mm -hmm. But it's all about the timing because mm -hmm. some start their processes earlier than others. So um, some will leave earlier than others, but at the end of the day, you can be certain that they will all move. If they okay. decide to stay, then it may be due to some family reasons or some um, personal reasons, because the underlining issues of the individual nurse or midwife or mm -hmm. doctor or pharmacist taking that informed decision mm -hmm. to move out is premised on poor conditions of service, lack of um, available equipment to work with, poor working environment, sometimes working under difficult management who are making your life miserable, or some HR policies that are really not working well. And at the end of the day, mm. the knowledge that your worth, your worth in terms of what you bring to the table or what you can do is worth much more out there. And they have this information because their colleagues are out, are out there and they talk to them, they see what they are able to come and do back home once they are there for um, two years, three years. They mm. see it all. So then that decision is made that I want to move. And it is their right. It is fundamentally a worker's right to move. There are no restrictions across borders. Once I can put in the proper documentation mm. and also get the receiving country to um, verify my license and all mm. of that, nothing mm. stops me from moving. It is our responsibility as a nation to now put in the strategies that can help us to retain our professionals by making the work environment more attractive mm. for them to stay. Mm. Because, yes, of course, we cannot compete with these high income earning countries in terms of the remuneration. Out there in the UK, somebody can be taking as much as maybe 30 pounds per hour, 
when you get to the U.S., hovering around 40 to 45 dollars an hour, we cannot compete as a middle income earning country. But at the same time, there are certain things that we can put in place to, to retain our health workers. We have talked about something like the rural incentive package, which will help to attract and retain our colleagues in the sub-district levels and all of that. This document, we are told, is still with cabinet. It hasn't seen the light of day in terms of approval. Mm. And we think that it's a crucial document that needs to be approved so that our colleagues that are working in these areas will be more motivated to stay and work because those terrains are really difficult to serve uh, without, um, with a lack of social amenities, um, lack of good schools, um, lack of even um, good marriage materials. And mm. most of our people are young women. Most of our members are young women. They are posted out there. And it's really difficult in terms of their socioeconomic standing. So a lot needs to be done. And um, I think that um, for me, if today the, the private medical mm. and dental um, practitioners mm. open the, the box for these conversations mm. again. Okay. Because now, did, 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 yeah, I hear, yeah. did I hear you? Did, did I hear you mention marriage as well? Of course, it is. It's it's very important. Okay. If you, it is part of your plan to get married and start a family. The fact that you are posted to a certain vicinity has impact on that decision because mm. then it's it may restrict your 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 market in terms of who can propose to you or who you can date and all of that. Mm. And I'm saying it on authority that our young people who are sent out there, most of them lose the relationships they had nurtured for years. Some mm. end up um, losing their husbands, those who have already gotten married because mm. they've been posted to some place. And it makes it very difficult um, nurturing that relationship and making it grow. So those are the realities. And it's just, um, a difficult issue that um, our colleagues sometimes have to grapple with. Mm. And of course, the bigger the bigger conversation comes, it always comes to the remuneration. And we, had, we did some research as far back as 2011. The report came out in 2012. Mm. We did it with the Public Services International. Uh, and um, I tell you, recently, the National Military Council also did a survey on this migration. And the, the reports, what we saw in 2012 and what we saw in 2023, mm -hmm. is, is not different. The same reasons that apply then apply now in terms of the decisions people have to make to move out, the reasons mm -hmm. why they want to go to practice elsewhere or mm -hmm. to work elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, have, we have a responsibility mm -hmm. as a country because those who are moving out are usually the well-experienced ones with many years of experience who could mentor the new ones who are coming into the profession. Mm. And they are nowhere to be found because they, they have already traveled abroad. Go government does complain, and, and I think we've, we've all seen the reality staring at us, that this country is not in good standing when it comes to finances. What then can government realistically do to reverse the trend? I talked about the fact that we need to improve all the, the, the poor work environment, the lack of equipment or logistics, mm. the inavailability of, um, in some cases, clear career progression, mm. uh, poor remuneration, and all of that are the, the, the root causes of migration. You see, government at this moment finds its, itself in a place where we, we are under the IMF and all of those things. Mm -hmm. But it is not just this government. You see, it's successive governments and the decisions that have been taken in terms of the health sector and investment in the professionals uh, who work in this space. So it will not take, it will, it, we can't do anything in a month or two or in three months, mm -hmm. but we need to set out a plan, a plan that can have long, it can be medium term, it can be long term, that can have impact on the professionals who work within the, the health space so that it can actually lead to the retention of mm. professionals. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean let, let's see how this goes. But let me bring in Dr. Med Andre uh, Kwesi Kuma. He's president of the Society of Private Medical Practitioners. We, under, we, we, we got to, or we have the impression 
that the private sector is, is quite attractive to these doctors. Are you also being faced by these challenges or yours is quite manageable? Dr. Andrew Kazukuma, if I have you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yes, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, hello. Okay. Well, it's not better. I mean, in some cases, it seems the public sector is, is getting better than us because not all our hospitals are able to pay our doctors that much. Mm. Um, there are many hospitals that are small and medium size. Not all the hospitals are large and can afford those salaries that can compete with the public sector. So uh, it's, it's not um, rosy here as it may seem. Mm. Mm. Uh, we are also facing the, the brands of the brain drain. Of course, that's why we took it up as our major topic for the AGM um, this year. Okay. We also have experienced nurses, experienced doctors, and they also mm. leave us. And then we have to get new ones to train only for them to also leave after um, a few years. So mm. we are facing, we are all facing it. Um, mm. One thing that we discussed at our meeting today was that about a little over 24 years ago, African countries in the AU took a decision to allocate 15% of their budget to the health sector, but only three countries in Africa, uh, Eritrea, Seychelles, and another one, you know, complied. Ghana is at 6.1%, mm. down from 6.4%. So if maybe more resources can be allocated to the health sector, it can, you know, inure to the conditions that can keep our health sector, I mean, health personnel here. But, but, but how, 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 does that, how does that, and I'm sure mm, more, yeah. how does that help you in the private sector? If government should, should allocate those resources, it goes to the public sector. So how does that benefit you in the private sector? Well, I mean, the private sector is all part of the Ghana health system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are collaborations that we have with government where the money may not come directly to us, but we can be supported with um, equipment and some logistics, which then the, the savings we will make from those purchases can go into our human resource budget and can help retain mm. um, health workers. The other ways government can support us, if, for example, waivers on medical equipment or lower taxes, all this can bring us savings, which can go into our human resource uh, budgets and then can make our health personnel more comfortable and keep them here. Mm -hmm. It's quite a troubling situation. I mean, from where we are, what would be a proposal to government as to how government could help retain some of these staff here? We, we all know that the economy isn't good. I mean, Perpetual has given us the, some of the things they could do to hold on to nurses. But from where you sit, what can government really do? <laughs> Pay doctors and nurses better. And, and, and we I mean, know that we are, we are, we are all in a, in a difficult financial situation. <laughs> well, um, I think I mean, government will have to stretch, just stretch a little more to make the, the I mean, health workers uh, better, you know, and also support mm. other amenities that can make their lives more comfortable. And that will help. I mean, bottom line, it comes down to the economy. Okay. Uh, it comes down to what the economy can do because the countries that are attracting our health workers are richer than us, and therefore they have more money to spend. Mm -hmm. So the, the bottom line is that we should also spend more on our health workers um, to keep them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, I, I guess this conversation really goes beyond the health sector. Let's bring in the teachers to find, and, and find out whether or not they, they are also going through the same uh, challenge. And uh, Angel Carbono is president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRA. Angel, grateful that you could agree to join us here in this, uh, on this conversation. Now, what is the situation like for teachers? Are you also leaving? How many have you lost so far? Well, I'll, I'll, well good afternoon and good afternoon to my colleagues, especially uh, Perpetual and Robert. Uh, when Perpetua was talking about the marriage thing, I wanted to say that those days the teachers were marrying the nurses until our finances plummeted to the lowest level, so we can't marry them anymore uh, these <laughs> days. Uh, but on a more serious note, let mm. me stretch mm. the frontiers of this discussion beyond 
my sector education and say that mm. the general economic malaise of the country mm -hmm. is one of the factors that pushes people out of their own country. And that even when you isolate a group of people yeah. and pay them well or pay them very high, that amount of money is consumed by his or her relatives who may not be working or who are not well endowed. Mm -hmm. And so it is the general economic situation mm -hmm. that is causing this. Look, apart from those who work in public sector, a lot of Ghanaians are also getting out of this country in droves. High numbers, people want to run away through the Sahara Desert. People are using untoward means to get out of the country because there is a perceived greener pasture somewhere that they want to go and enjoy. Teachers are not exempted, nurses are not exempted, doctors are not exempted. So it is a factor of the type of environment, economic and social environment, that we find ourselves. After all, under normal circumstances, who wants to go and live in that cold and go through the hazards of a foreign country in the first place? Mm -hmm. So that is the primary reason why people are leaving. Number two, there is a historical perception that it is okay out there in Europe. Um, I have visited London some time ago and I saw some teachers who left this country and I have been working in London for a while. Um, I, I want to dare say that they are not living in paradise. In okay. fact, sometimes the situation is totally different from what they thought it, it, it was before they left this country. Mm. But the fact still remains. Last time I was talking to Dr. Adepoku, the uh, registrar of NTC, and he says he has processed about 10,000 requests uh, of, uh, of teachers who wanted to leave this country and get to other countries to go and teach. Mm. There are agencies that now come around work, uh, schools to try and coach teachers through a certain scheme, some of which, let me state uh, cautiously, have turned out to be fraudulent, mm. but others also were able to take people out of this country to other countries where they mm. believe that mm. the salaries um, mm. uh, are better. Mm. Look, what is the housing situation in this country? How many public sector workers can put up a house? What is the uh, income and remuneration situation in this country? How many people's salary can take them home and make anything meaningful? Mm. What mm. is the cost of university education? And let me say, what is the cost of education in general? Because in spite of the fact that we have free senior high school, parents will tell you how much they yeah, uh, spend to maintain their children mm -hmm. in a free senior high school environment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the general cost of living is a major contributory factor and until such a time okay. that our government see this and try to find solutions to the economic malaise of our country, then we will have a very long way to go. Okay. The most okay. dangerous part, and let me say this briefly, the mm. most dangerous part is that people feel so despondent in their own country and, we, and they are thrown out there and they face challenges and problems. That is not even reported. And at the end of the day, mm. we create more problems for our people. Mm. Okay. All right. Let, let me bring in Dr. Richard Solome, uh, Salome again. He's General Secretary of the Medical Association. Doc, so let's look for, for, for a solution. Uh, what, what are you expecting to happen uh, or what do you expect to happen to reverse the trend we are seeing? Thank you. Um, I think uh, Perpetua has mentioned a few. Mm -hmm. Also, Dr. Medandre Kwesikuma has also spoken about some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, since uh, my brother, uh, uh, Dr. Kabono, mm -hmm. was veering into our nursing doctor relationships, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I he's also mentioned a few things, but uh -huh. on a serious note, uh -huh. There are things that we could do that are not necessarily monetary. Okay. The okay. Ghana Medical Association has taken a bold step to try to attract doctors to deprived areas where care is being hampered. Mm. And we put in a few measures. 
One was ensuring they had mentors. Two, negotiating with the traditional authorities to release some parcels of land. And this has been piloted in our voter division, heavily led by our divisional chair, Dr. Met Kwekwe PAJ. And even in places where at first, hitherto, the doctors would not accept postings, we had over 12 people applying to go to such places. So with a few things in place, assuring some of these health workers, a parcel of land here and there, assuring them early release for specialist training, mm. giving them avenues to be able to attend workshops, adding on some extra training, and a few allowances here and there to top up what they have, and improving amenities, road networks around. Many of these people who we think will not stay in the country will stay in the country. Okay. The rest is more of the larger picture where we are looking at uh, the, the economics as a bigger way. But of course, that is very important as well. Mm. The mm. general economic condition, when it improves, improves a lot of other things in the space. Also, the government may have to look at tax incentives for especially our private uh, 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 facilities. It is very important because we are getting to a stage where government itself is unable to absorb all the workers that have been produced in the country. Mm -hmm. Already, as Perpetual has alluded to, we are in, at IMF, we have serious structural issues, DGEP, etc. Why not incentivize the private sector to employ more? Incentivize them to be able to take on some of these people and also incentivize them so that they'll be able to generate a little bit more by themselves and also reduce their overhead so that they can pay this, uh, uh, some of these workers who stay on. Some of these workers are finishing school and mm -hmm. staying home two years, three years, whilst they have nothing to do. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes difficult finishing school and sitting at home where sometimes in our parlance, your parents are looking at you. This is the time for you to begin to give back and we have to take care of you. Okay. Okay. They would have to find where to survive. And mm. so there are some of these things that are non-monetary. Mm. But of course, that government can begin to do, put incentives in place, uh, early promotions, especially for the deprived areas where people are not even accepting postings. Okay. The House of Chiefs and other mm. actors can also come in, mm. give some parcels of land. Banks and other actors can also begin to look at how to help people stay. Okay. If the typical doctor, nurse, pharmacist, lab professional, the typical thing they want is a, a, a decent car and a house. Mm. Can we look at the mortgage scheme? Well, once you get out of work, you have about five to 10 years. Well, unfortunately, Dr. Salomon's line has uh, dropped there, but, but some <laughs> wonderful proposals that he's, he's, uh, he's, he's made there. Uh, uh, Okay, Doc's line is still not, not in the best of shapes, but he's giving some fantastic proposals, and we're grateful to you, Doc, for joining us here. Let me bring in Perpetual Ampo. So, so Pep, j just to wrap it all up, I mean, you had Doc there to talk about some sort of land uh, mortgage system that could then the health sector workers could take advantage of. I, I mean, will this help solve the this, this situation? The, the voice was intertwining with Dr. Salome's own, so I didn't hear your question well. What did you say, please? Okay, so, so Dr. Salome is making some proposals as to, I mean, yes. availability of land for you mm -hmm. because what health workers are looking for is a, a convenient house and a car, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So if there could be some mortgage systems or more, uh, that, mm -hmm. that could, could cater for your needs, it could help. And I'm asking whether that is what could do the trick. That could help, yes, it could do the trick. And more so, mm -hmm. we have requested that government gives us the vehicle input waiver. Because when people are struggling, people are working, one, they want to get their own house mm -hmm. or own their own uh, um, building or get a land and build. They want to own a car and mm -hmm. all of that. So give us back that waiver that was instituted years ago by... Um, then President Kufo, it was taken off during the NDC government period. Mm. Let's bring it back. Let every health worker enjoy that. Mm. Then if you have a friend, you have a family member abroad who can buy you that car, 
you know when you put in the right documentation, you can get it out of the port easily. Because now the, the um, import, import taxes have gone up so high mm -hmm. that sometimes, depending on the vehicle that you are actually um, getting out of the port, you may be paying an amount that is equivalent to even buying a small vehicle, another vehicle um, in the country. So we can, government can do this without having to pay money to anybody. So okay. the vehicle import tax waiver can be reinstituted for all of us. Mm, mm. Uh, medical care is one difficult area. Medical care. When you are a health worker, yes, on paper, as part of our conditions of service, you are supposed to be taken, off, taken care of by the employer. But in reality, this is not happening. Uh, most, for most conditions that nurses uh, are bedeviled with, you need to take money out of your pocket to pay for these conditions. Mm -hmm. And it is really difficult. At the level of the association, we are doing so much to help in terms of welfare benefits that we have put in place to support our, our colleagues and indirectly also help with the retention. We have mm -hmm. instituted... Our annual, our annual dinner and awards program to award and motivate nurses and midwives across the country. We have these uh, mortgage packages with certain banks. We have the land, um, land systems in place. We have loan systems in place. But these are all in-house, union in-house based. But we need a more a robust or more vigorous system by government, by government as the mm. overall employer okay. to help in terms of investments in nurses, in other health professionals, and in the health system to actually help with the retention of mm. nurses and midwives. Mm. But by if, you course, already, if, if you already have the mortgage we, system, how different would the government's own be from, from what you do have that you think could help retain some of these uh, personnel here? The truth of the matter is that we have it with the banks. So you know the current, uh, uh, mm. the, the, the interest rates and all mm. of that. Mm. It is not conducive. Okay. You know, but where a package has been put in by government as a source of, or as a, a means of retention, then we mm. want to believe that that will be more, um, more, let me, for lack of a better word, more mm. reasonable okay. and more because mm. at the end of the day, the mm. salaries of our colleagues are not good. It's not good across all so, the so, so you want and, to say it will be more so affordable? The level of more affordable, yes. Mm. 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 All right. Uh, uh, grateful to you, Perpetual. I hope that government is listening and they will do exactly what you're asking so that this can be done. Uh, uh, Angel Carbono, just before I let you go, you've heard the proposals from the, from the health professionals. For teachers, what should be done? pretty much the same across the public sector. Okay. Um, when you post a female teacher to an overseas area of OT region, uh, the same factors will affect that female teacher. Uh, when you post a teacher where the teacher does not even have a accommodation, mm. the That's same will affect that teacher. And you know, currently in the public sector, mm. uh, you build for life. You know, you start building when you are employed and you almost get finished when you're about to go on retirement. <laughs> that is how people are surviving. A lot of people move to their uncompleted houses and they hope and pray that their children will come and complete it for them. A, a reflection of the type of environment, economic environment we find mm. ourselves. Mm. So I think that the first thing, you know, I have difficulty in even professing solutions because mm. on what rock are you going to make suggestions for the solution when you know that the politicians have turned the, 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 the economy of our country upside down. Mm. Mm. They, the politicians are responsible for the situation we find ourselves. They shouldn't think that it came by an act of God. It came by an act of political irresponsibility that is affecting Ghanaians and public sector workers. Mm. And they ought to take the blame, you know, mm. and that is why people, we have the flight that we are talking about from our own country. Mm. And that they, they have to fix it, bring back all that they've taken, sacrifice all monies that they have messed up with so we can repair our society and repair our economy. Okay. We don't have any kind words for them. Mm. 
All right. Uh, Angel, I'm grateful to you for joining us here. And thank you, uh, gentlemen and lady, uh, for being part of this conversation. I, I, I hope that this will continue and the government will listen and uh, will try to fix, like Angel says, our public sector because the public sector is really bleeding. Let's see how it goes. But uh, there's a uh, large more conversations to come. But because related to this conversation, the United States embassy in, in Accra is uh, suggesting that the number of Ghanaians seeking to enter America has shot up significantly. And they're even giving numbers to the number of people who are trying to escape Ghana. And they say that the numbers that are applying as far as uh, stripping the resources available to process the visas. We have more of that on that conversation after the break. Please do stay with us. Uh, welcome back from the break. The United States Embassy in Accra says the number of Ghanaians seeking to enter America has shot up significantly and is even now stripping the increased resources to process visa applications speedily. Although the U.S. mission concedes the movement of people between two nations will enhance its people-to-people uh, people relations with Ghana, there's an emerging constraint where the demand for U.S. visas has tripled since 2019, hence creating the backlog. The remarks are coming at a time when the U.S. Embassy plans to migrate all visa applications onto a new system starting August 16. In view of this, no new visa applications will be made until the 26th of August, when the new framework is ready. Elliot Fertik, uh, uh, Fertik is the American Consul General in Ghana. He has been explaining arrangements for the new visa system while revealing that Ghanaians seeking to enter has surged significantly. We know there's always a lot of interest in visas, and especially in our non-immigrant visa uh, system. And we want to make sure that our visa applicants and the, the, the Ghanaian public generally is aware of this change and what they may need to do, if anything. The most important point to make is that we are going to be moving to a new visa services provider on August 26, 2024. However, and this is the most probably the most important thing I'm going to say today, all existing non-immigrant visa interview appointments remain valid. That means that if you currently have a visa interview scheduled with the U.S. Embassy, it is still valid and you should plan on attending the appointment on the day, the interview on the day of the appointment. Um, the first thing is that on August 16th, the old appointment system website will no longer be uh, accessible for changes. What that means is that you will no longer, you will on, starting on the, the, on the morning of August 16th, you will no longer be able to schedule new appointments, you will not be able to make visa fee payments, and customer service will not be, will not be accessible. In addition, if you have made a request for an emergency or expedited appointment and have not received a response by August, by August 16th, you will need to resubmit your request in the new scheduling system on or after August 26th. So, as I said, this is important. During the period between August 16th and August 26th, you will not be able to make new visa appointments or, and you will not be able to cancel or reschedule any existing appointments. But if you have an appointment already scheduled during that time, it is still valid, we will still interview you, and you should still come to the, to the embassy for your appointment. Well, in a certain sense, the demand is a, a, a very, very flattering for the United States. I mean, a lot of Ghanaians want to go to the United States to visit temporarily. And, you know, we're seeing it's not just non-immigrant visas on the immigrant visa side, diversity visa. Again, the numbers are through the roof. Um, and, you know, we, we, want to, we, we want to encourage as much legitimate travel between the United States and Ghana as we can. It is incredibly important to us. We want to encourage qualified students to study in the United States. Um, and that's why, as I said, you know, that's why we've had brought in more resources to doing interviews. Unfortunately, the demand is outstripping even the increased resources we've had. Um, and we're going to continue and we're going to continue to increasing our resources, you know, looking at ways to be more efficient, encouraging people to use 
um, systems like you know getting renewal the interview waiver process when they when they qualify. Um, and again, I would just say that this new visa appointment system is not really connected one way or the other with the demand. The demand, it, the demand is what drives the long wait times. So if you have, if you're renewing your visa, I would highly encourage you to look at our website and see if you're eligible for our visa waiver, sorry, our, our interview waiver program. The second thing is that we do have a process for asking for expedited appointments. Um, I will, you know, in, in, in emergency cases for urgent, things like urgent medical travel, unexpected and urgent business travel, and for students who are not able to apply, have not been able to get an appointment within 60 days of their start date in the United States. For the expedited appointments, I should say right now, the bar to getting, the, 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 the the bar to getting an appointment is very, very high. We have a limited, very limited number of, of, of these kinds of cases, of these kinds of appointments, and um, we have to. That means we only can take the most urgent of cases. But that process does it does exist. Well, so that uh, is the situation of the U.S. Embassy here in Accra. But away from that, it's been touted as the solution to the deplorable state of the Confanochi Teaching Hospital, built to help ease the health burden on the people. But its start has faced significant bottlenecks, despite the involvement of the Otun Fawcett to the second himself. The hospital also takes referrals from the northern, uh, northeast, Savannah, Bono East, Bono, Ahafo, Central and Western North regions, Years of being stretched to its limit with no corresponding redevelopment have left the hospital sick and in dire need of surgery. So the hospital itself has to be worked on. The management, with support from the Asantene, launched the Heal Confernity project to raise $10 million to rehabilitate some structures of the hospital. And uh, this afternoon, I'm joined by the head of public affairs, uh, with the hospital, Kwame Frimpong, uh, who is also uh, and also chairman of the Confanoche Teaching Hospital, uh, teaching uh, the Heal Confanoche Project, Sami Edubuache, the CEO of the hospital, Professor uh, Otre Adai Mensa, will also be joining on uh, Zoom. Uh, thank you uh, for, for coming. Uh, I hope all is well. All is well, and a very good afternoon mm -hmm. to your esteemed audiences out there. Thank mm -hmm. you to Multimedia for the opportunity to promote the Hill Confanochi project. We are very grateful. Okay. So first off, yes. um, let's understand the progress of work so far. Well, thank you very much, Kojo. Um, currently, we are on the A4, A5 uh, mm -hmm. block, and we are optimistic that within the next... Uh, one and a half months, by the end of September, uh, work should have been completed for patients to be able to move in back there for us to tackle the other floors of the hospital. We are also privileged to mention that for nearly 30 years, uh, Confanochi Teaching Hospital is not experiencing the leakages that it used to experience during uh, the rainy season. So as I speak, there are no more leakages at the hospital uh, due to the intervention of His Majesty. And the uh, uh, inspirational leadership of the CEO and the management, Professor Otre, Adair Mensah, and with the support of the general public, we are making some good progress. Mm, mm. Oh, and that good progress involves what and what? Um, the good progress involves mm. the fundraising drive that we are still doing. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we have reached about 40% of our target of $10 million, which means we are around $4 million which is no child's play. Yeah. And this, mm. is, this fundraising has been spearheaded by His Majesty himself. Mm. Uh, there are times that individuals, corporate organizations that visit the palace or pay courtesy calls when him are reminded or are uh, queried, <laughs> have you paid your uh, quota to the Hilco <laughs> Fonochi project? Because this is for all of us. Uh -huh. And remind us, go and pay. So okay. it's for us and it's by mm. us. Uh, but I mean, in general, how's the fundraising going? Uh, it's good that you say you've reached four million. Yes. Um, to be one. honest with you, what happened there in the ideation stage had this concept of having to pull one million Ghanaians mm. to donate a hundred cities each towards yeah. the project. Yeah. That means that at the time, uh, the committee would have been able to raise eight million dollars. 
if we had one million Ghanaians, both home and abroad, coming on board to donate 100 Ghana yeah. cities each. Mm. Unfortunately, the exchange rate has not been our friend. And that drive is not coming as it is expected. Uh, where we have reached is just a handful of people. But however, let us be grateful for what has happened because for a period of about five, six months, if you have been able to raise $4 million, mm. it is no child's play. So we say a big thank you to our donors mm. uh, for this feat that we have achieved, except that I'll accept to say that. Dudwana um, Ninyambaya, we have a long way to go. And this project strives on the uh, fundraising for us to be able to make the needed uh, progress for the hospital to come back to its appreciable uh, uh, state. Mm. All right, so that is where it is in terms of you know, the, the fundraising the fund itself. Yes. Um, a lot of people are giving, I guess, but we still need more because you said for, we are 4 we million. St we st we still need more. We need, we need to get a 6 million in addition. To be honest with you, mm. um, you know, the, doing a renovation is more difficult than starting a fresh project. Mm. Our projection of $10 million, the, the scope of the project has kept expanding mm. uh, based on what the contractors are telling us. You know, mm. when you're doing a renovation, you get some and realize that, hey, this is not what I anticipated or this is not where we envisage. It means that a lot more has to happen. Um, the core mandate of the uh, committee was to refurbish the physical structure. Mm. However, it has also become very important that you cannot do this good job mm. and then put in old uh, beds, et cetera. Yeah. So the focus of um, having to get the new hospital equipment to fit the state of the art uh, renovation that, that, that we want to mm. do mm. Uh, is one that has taken a big toll on us. But we have not given up. A mm. lot of support will be coming from uh, individuals, corporate mm. organizations, churches, mm. et cetera, to be able to do this. Mm. You won't believe that um, in consultation with the heads of department at the various uh, 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 distance of the hospital. Some of the blocks, one block is costing us close to $1.2 million to get prioritized equipment wow. for the hospital. Hospital beds alone. And these are all part of the $10 million you're raising? This is part of the $10 million that we are raising, except that the scope keeps expanding. Mm. So obviously somebody will come, uh, a department will come telling us that, these are the things that we need. And of course, it will obviously uh, shoot, shoot the, the, the budget up mm. as and when it Which arrives. means that the target has, has gone beyond $10 million. The target has gone beyond $10 million, mm. except to say, we see, we don't want to scare anybody. Yeah. If this were to be a project outside mm. our government undertaking, you realize that it wouldn't be what it is. Mm. And so we, from the onset, had a special approach where we were doing um, specialist contractors to be able to do this. So it meant that the phases of the project, which is plumbing, electrical works, mechanical works, and then also ceiling and then the windows, mm. all these coming into play meant that we could get specialized contractors to be able to address this. Unfortunately, what happens is that as we made progress, it meant that we didn't have to bring all of them under the same period. Mm. So it means that we have been able to find a good contractor, Kisa, the one who undertook the Kumasi Tamale Airport, and then also currently doing the MEP at the KJTR terminal is the main contractor at site. Okay. And therefore, it gives us some uh, uh, level of confidence with the work that is happening. Mm. Now, what it means is that, well, we, we, we will get there. We will get there. The point mm. is that it's not an easy task as we envisage from the start. Mm. It's not an easy task. But as he progresses, you realize that it's bigger than you, you even it, It's bigger than how you we imagined. envisaged from, mm. the, from the beginning. Mm. 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 Um, but we, can, we, we are making some good progress. And like I said, if for nothing at all, by the end of this year, the one, one of the blocks, the A block, would have been completed fully. Okay. So that people will see people that will see the monies we gave. gave is there. Yeah. It's not just by the end of the year. We are also looking forward to the fact that by the end of September, the first two floors will be occupied, will be, have been completed. His mm. Majesty and other donors will come and inspect it and then we'll send the patients back. You know, the mm. hospital is still in operation. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that if it is in operation, you cannot have the block to yourself and do the day and night work as it is that you had planned. Okay. And that is also more or less the NBU block where mothers, babies are there. Ah. So it is a bit uh, cumbersome. Okay, yes. okay. But, but are you targeted? Uh, groups responding to this call by, by, by Otunfo especially? 
to a large extent, uh, if I'm being candid, it is not as we have anticipated. Okay. Uh, the response has not been very encouraging, mm. um, owing to the fact that you realize that politicians, MMDCs, churches, most identifiable groups, corporate Ghana, when you look at the last list we published in the Daily Graphic, um, it meant that even corporate Ghana's response is not up to 15. Oh, yes. so not up to 15 corporate 15 companies, entities, entities that ha have come. Okay. Um, just uh, we launched the uh, Upon Food, the Hila concept, where all companies that we have reached out to or we have engaged, we do something of uh, satirical uh, attack. Mm. So tomorrow's one that is coming is more to say, Upon Food is saying that. So no OMC has donated to this project. Uh -huh. exactly. Because none of them, none of uh, them uh, however, has. Yes, however, okay. Okonfo singles out Goyle and says thank you to Goyle because Goyle has donated uh, 200,000 Ghana cities mm. to the project. Mm. And then the MD himself, Kwame Oseprempe, has also donated. So beyond Goyle, none of the OMCs have come on board. Okay. None of the mining companies I, I have responded to His mm. Majesty's call. We want to believe that, as I but as it on my the response has not been as we we anticipated, except mm. to say that we have done well, but there's a lot more work to be done. Mm. This work needs money. This work desires that we raise the ten million dollars. And anything that comes beyond that, we'll be able to do a lot more of the equipment as mm. the nurses wish that it has to be done. Well, for not as you rightly said. A referral point for 12 out of the 16 regions of Ghana. Mm. The second largest hospital in Ghana. And the only teaching hospital within that part of Ghana. Mm. Neighboring countries coming on board. Mm. And for 70 years, haven't seen any renovation. Yeah. Taking His Majesty to do this. It's not to say that the government is not doing anything. Mm. But mm. remember that, Charlie, every country's development does not rest with only the government. Oh, sure. Yeah. Private individuals and like the leadership of His Majesty mm. is very important to the cause of the development of Asantiman Ghana and then also mm. uh, Konfanochi Teaching Hospital in there. So, so you mentioned that politicians. So politicians, has government provided any support? Uh, MMDCs, have they provided support? I've, I've not, I'm, on my list there is no, uh, none of the MMDCs have responded to His Majesty's call. Uh, MPs that have responded are just about eight of them. Just about eight MPs. There are about 40, some 43 MPs in Ashanti region mm. with the MMDCs. However, let me be candid to mention that uh, the mayor gave us 20,000 on the day of the launch. The regional minister also gave us 50,000 uh, a few months after. The regional minister promised that he was going to mobilize the MMDCs, at least if every uh, uh, one of them paid 10,000, meant that they could do this. And it is not the quantum of amount that they will bring, but the fact that when they show up, it encourages the others to also come mm -hmm. on board. Mm -hmm. Churches, just about 10 churches so far. Meanwhile, to Kumasi Ashanti. 10 churches. 10, 10 churches. As for the uh, Muslim groups, within my list of 2,000 cities and above, I have only one person, and which is the Zongo Swahime. Mm -hmm. And it is um, time check about 4 o'clock, 4.30. If you go to Konfanochi as I speak, visiting hours. I can tell you in confidence that a lot more people coming to see their patients or relatives are Muslims. Okay. At this time, yes. But I have not seen, I mean, every list, the accountant gives me periodic update, mm -hmm. and I see every person that is donating, especially within the 2000s and above. None, no Muslim has donated. Mm -hmm. So our Muslim brothers and sisters have to come up. The Ashanti Regional Chief Imam is... Um, a member of the advisory board set for set by Dotun for to oversee to this mm. project, and sometimes he goes like, "I'm going for now, I'm going to see you." But um, I, I'm, I'm sure they are they are they are computing together, and then they will come out big, you know. Um, that is my wish. Yeah. That is the wish of all of us uh, mm. within the committee. That is our wish that these all of them will show up. Transport associations. Mm. Only one has showed up. Uh, that is pro to agree more, there's GPRT, there are concerns, etc. Mm. a lot of them. And you know, whatever happens, our road, the road carnages is one of the things that kills a lot of people in this country. Mm. So if transport owners are not showing up, I mm. wonder who else has to show up? Yeah, and again, uh, you know, uh, if, if someone, 
uh, if, if there's a road carnage, they will bring the and, and it's close to Convonachi, they will bring them there. So they really need to support they, they, this. They, they, yeah. they all need they, to come up. I was thinking they, that maybe if it is that they could show the progress of work um, for everyone to see. Okay, it. on the facility as the we facility speak. As well, as yeah, it, it won't be bad. It won't be bad. No, I'm we, sure we have, we have we have those videos. I'm sure they will show. I'm it sure. Yes, I'm sure. As, as we are speaking, it, yes. will, they, they, it will be rolled so that people can follow and see what exactly is, is, is happening. But I mean, I'm, I'm not. I don't know why they, you say churches have not come because they could even decide that in a particular month all the tithes that will come, they will get them together and then bring them to support this work because this is God's work as well. This is know. the most important thing. Mm. Like, we know sometimes you need to single out the Metropolitan Archbishop Gabriel mm. Anochi uh, led the uh, Metropolis uh, uh, Catholic churches to donate 350,000 cities. Mm. He did mm. that himself. And a big thank you to him. Uh, CCC has shown up uh, um, Pentecost Church, RCC. Pentecost is divided into three, uh, into four within the Ashanti Enclave. Only one has showed up. Anglican Diocese has shown up. And then the Anglican has given 110,000. Mm -hmm. And then a few other smaller churches that have come on board mm -hmm. to support. But within the Ashanti Enclave alone, there are more churches. There are more churches. And if they were to show up, mm -hmm. Even if it is 1,000, 5,000 cities, it means that they would have... What's the population of Ashanti region? Ashanti region, until the last population census, um, Ashanti was the most populous region mm. in Ghana. It is now that Accra, Greater Accra, has been able to mm. catch up. Yeah. And you know, healthcare distribution is done by mm. population. Unfortunately, when you come to Accra, we are saddled with uh, married of choices. We yeah. have UGMC, you have Ridge Hospital, you have uh, Ghana Maritime, you have the Bank Hospital, Kolibu, mm. 37, the police hospital, none of any of the mm. hospitals in Kumasi can be compared to uh, any of these hospitals mm. that I've mentioned, apart from Konfanochi Teaching Hospital. Yeah. Our and I, hospital mm. is just 100 or 120 bed capacity. Until the, the new ones come up, every pressure is on Konfanochi Teaching mm. Hospital. Mm. So it is very strategic in the healthcare production, uh, 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 distance of Ghana and needs the high level of attention to be able to and give proper health care to the people. Mm. Of the I was even asking for the numbers because I, I always believe in numbers. That, for example, you know, the strategy you mentioned earlier, if we have about, say, 5 million people in Ashanti region alone, and everybody says, I am giving 100 cities towards this cause, that's 100 cities by 5 million. That's what? 500 million, isn't it? We're getting that money. We're getting You know. It's not, it's not forced it, from the assets. You know. So, so even if everybody decides to, if every, we won't get every five, everybody or all of the 5 million people giving, and some 500,000 people decide to give 1,000 each, that's how much? That, that gives us a lot of money to be able to finish that. You know. So, so really, people should understand that. With but, but I hope people are giving the smaller ones to the 100 cities, the 200. It will interest you the, to know that we appreciate even the 50 pesos mm. in one Ghana. That's what they, they, all these. Are they coming? They come like that. Our mobile money hits have not reached 1 million yet. Okay. I haven't had, sorry, 1,000. 1,000 people donating to the mobile money. Mm. That is the easiest. Mm -hmm. but we, hasn't... Had, we are yet to have 1,000 people despite all the strategies and all of that. But mm. like I said earlier, mm. in CO2, a former day, we have done well, people are doing well, yeah. but we need to put in a little bit effort to support His Majesty's initiative. Mm. A little bit, because Confonoche is for us. Yeah. The people that you anticipate that they have to do it, most often when something happens, they may not even show up there, they will travel. Mm. See, mm. me and that we do not have, we will obviously end up there. Mm. Just recently, uh, Baumia's campaign team came to Kumasi, mm. and during the heat of the moment, mm. one of the big shots collapsed. Yeah. There yeah. was no yeah. option. That we rushed there. That to be brought to Komonachi. I wasn't there. I, I thought that they would have asked him, have you contributed okay. to the project? So, so then it leads me to ask, have the flag bearers donated to this? No. None of the flag bearers have. Mm. We have tried to engage them. Letters have been written. Um, the NDC flag bearer, I have spoken to S.C. Edwin Ketia. I have spoken to Fifi Kwete. I have spoken to the national organizer. I have spoken to the national youth organizer. I have spoken to Joyce Bauer. I have spoken to Julius. I have spoken to Callistos. And I said, look, let them show up. 
and let them even encourage others to do, I'm yet to get a response. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit disappointing for me. Okay. The same applies to uh, Baumia and team. Mm -hmm. They haven't shown up. But I am just being cautiously optimistic that they do. However, even if they don't, I tell you what, we will be able to achieve what we want to achieve. Yeah. We will bring Konfanoshe mm. to its uh, former glory. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Usually, you know, it takes that commitment from, from an individual to, to want to see, see a change. And I, I hope uh, Otufo has really shown that commitment and, and those of you helping him to have shown it and a few ones who have. I, I, I saw that of Jasmo. You know, Jasmo is with us in Takradi. So, so when I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah Jasmo, it's, Jasmo it's, is my biggest... Uh, yeah. Uh, contributor, yeah. my biggest donor, not okay. just just more, mm. uh, also the shop construction. Okay. And mm. I told you that it's his majesty who's leading this. Yeah. He's so passionate about it. Mm. Just more went to him to discuss something and yeah. he said, go to, uh, some, go, yeah, go, they are doing something. Go to out there. The mm. And then just more adopted one block. Mm. Oh, he adopted one he has block. He adopted one block. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. He has adopted one block. And oh. Oh, this, Chief, Chief Justice Amo. Yes. Uh, the CEO of Just More Constructions. Well, well done. Yeah, we uh, appreciate him so much. Mm. And then he is somebody who is so meticulous, comes for site meetings, uh, wants to see what is happening, mm. how it's supposed to be done. He's a contractor himself. Oh, he's so, a contractor himself. So, and so, so we are not surprised as to how committed he is to mm, the mm. course of the, of the project. Okay, all right. Uh, so we know that flag bearers have not. I hope that they listen and they come. But uh, now there, there were also some concerns about some foreign towels and other stuff you had procured from abroad that you know uh, we heard a lot about because of some, some okay. uh, you know import duties and what have you. What are, what was the update on that? Okay, let me put this in the right perspective. Mm. Everything that we need for this uh, project mm. that we can find in this country. We are getting them from here. Okay. It is not surprising that the contractors who are doing this are all Ghanaian contractors. Mm. Now, um, the ones doing the windows, Interplus mm. Ghana, Ghana, Ghanaian company. Mm. Um, the ones doing the ceiling are all Ghanaian companies. The ones doing the civil works are all Ghanaian companies. So mm. we are very conscious about that. However, when it comes to the tiles issue, let me put this right. We needed certified hospital grade tiles mm. for education of everybody. People may have thought that the tiles that they find or they use for their homes or offices were the tiles that we should have gone easily to the market to find or to buy. However, even in your own home, remember that sometimes where you frequent the most, you realize that after a short time, the tiles is either fading yeah. or is cracking. Yeah. So we needed hospital grade tiles, certified. And this could not be found in this country. We had done a lot of okay. uh, search. Mm. Any company that we went to said, I was going to import. So them. that's why you imported. So that's have why. Have you cleared them now? We have cleared them. Okay. Um, with All the right. Bruhaha that happened around it, mm. we got a Ministry of Finance committing to pay 1.2 million out of the 1.9 million, of which we are so grateful to the Ministry for So this. that could be government support, isn't it? Um, well, you cannot, you cannot write it off. Okay. It's government support. Okay. In recent times, the Minister of Health, Oko Boy, when he paid a visit, working visit to Ashanti region, mm. also donated 100,000 as the Ministry of Health's uh, contribution to okay. the project, of All which right. I'm expecting more, yeah, more from, from them. So okay. we cannot say that. We cannot be ungrateful. Okay. Because if you're going to pay 1.9 million, government says I've given you uh, 1.2 million. Mm. Um, that is a lot of money to okay. us, and then we are very grateful. All right, okay. So if you have not donated, please kindly donate to Hugh Comfort Noche now. You can dial star 776 star. One nine five five hash. I mean to me, okay. So you can uh, yes. dial star seven seven six star one nine five five. Okay, hash. Okay, so you want to say star seven seven six star nineteen fifty five hash. Okay, all right. It cuts across all networks. Okay, and then right. the, the simple mobile money that our grandmothers and people who are not mm -hmm. into tech can use a uh, zero five four four. Mm -hmm. 1955-25, okay. 0544-1955-20. For the benefit of those who would want to have more details, our social media platforms, websites are all very active. Okay. They are all healconfanoche.org. Okay. The type of healconfanoche or heal is the first thing that is likely to pop up. Our website, uh, uh, 
Facebook, Instagram. Yeah, all, yeah, uh, all okay. There, there. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I wish you all the best, and we will keep an eye on how this progresses. I hope that when we have been able to complete the first mm -hmm. two, I'm sure that multimedia, with its level of support and commitment to the project, mm -hmm. will be able to come around to see sure. how far we have come. You can trust multimedia on that one. Thank well, you very much. This is still the pulse here. We will take a quick break. We will be back and look at the Ghana you and I want. Wouldn't you want to join this conversation? Stay. All right, so welcome back from the break. Let's do this. Now, every time we talk about we want Ghana to be this, we want Ghana to be that, but what sort of Ghana do we want? And today on the Ghana we want, we're talking about education. Ghana's education system is generally regarded as one of the better systems in West Africa. But the country has made significant strides in improving uh, you know, access to uh, education, increasing enrollment rate, and expanding infrastructure. Now, key indicators such as literacy rate, school enrollment, and student performance in standardized examinations often place Ghana among the top performers in the region. However, challenges persist in areas such as the quality of education, infrastructure, maintaining a high educational standards, and bridging the gap between industry and academia, which is quite important in terms of the people we produce. Today on the Ghana We Want segment, we're speaking with concerned Ghanaians about their thoughts on the trajectory of the educational system and what they think the government and stakeholders in education can do better. Joining me is Daniel Selome, um, uh, Ohima AJ, and Clifford Lajekbo. He's director of academics, GH Media School. Uh, uh, so, thank you for joining us. Uh, let me start with you, Daniel. Did you complete your full education in Ghana? And if so, what do you think about the system then and now? You need to speak on your show. Um, yes, I, I did complete all my education here in Ghana, mm. from uh, basic to university level. Mm. <laughs> um, the, the contrast now between when I was in school and now is very huge. In fact, um, when I was in school, I, I did the three years and we didn't have the double track system. It wasn't free education. So, uh, yeah, essentially I paid school fees to go to school, but now we have free SHS. But as to whether it's exactly free, that's what we're going to discuss today. Yeah. Mm. Well, but, 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 but I mean, w if you put away the free and non-free, what do you see has changed about the education for you then and now? So at this point, I don't really trust whether or not the free education that we have now and the number of people we are taking in and uh, the infrastructure that we have and also the teachers that are available, if they are able to you know, take care of all the students as needed, giving them the needed attention. And, and so I don't, I'm not sure how many schools we've built so far since we, we started the free SHS. And I, I haven't been able to find any statistics, but I don't think that we really prepared for the implementation of free SHS. Mm -hmm. We essentially rushed into it, and there are challenges that we need to address. I, I have a report here from what was it, Edge Watch, and it says that the cost that parents bear when it comes to uh, students in SHS, for instance, it's only 23% that free SHS, when it comes to free SHS, it, it takes. The government is able to pay only 23%, and so essentially, the 77% that is left, people who are not well to do are not able to afford it. So, I mean, there are challenges that we need to address. The number of people that are coming into the free SHS, is there enough, I mean, basically, is there enough food for them to, mm. to be able to go to school and be comfortable? Mm. And how, I mean, be able to learn, you understand that? Okay. Let me bring in Ahima uh, Ajay. Ahima, uh, so what about you? Do you think uh, the system, what, what, what do you think about the system during your time and now? Well, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I had opportunity to school all my life in Ghana. Okay. And um, it cannot, the two, the two systems, or let's say the two um, times period, of pe period, you mean. school cannot, yeah, the period cannot be compared to as it is now. Mm. Um, even varying from the governmental side, now it looks like the teachers have a lot of pressure on them. 
Mm. Now, my, my, my point is, are they ready to take on as many people as we have in the schools now? Do they have a break? Because I know now there's a double track system where we have the second batch go in, they vacate, and the second batch goes in. Do these teachers have the, the, the ability to take on these two batches at the same time? Because these are human beings we are talking about here. Okay, so I think this, this system is good. It, it helps for everybody to bring in the awards, whether you have the money or not. But at the end of the day, when, when these kids come out of the school, are they well equipped? Do they have that basic knowledge to, to get them into the unis or they just go with substandard knowledge and they cannot really match up with those who um, in a way, come, are coming out from the, the, the private sector. Mm. That is my, 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 my worry now. Okay. Are, so, they well taught, are they well brought up in the schools? Those are the questions that I have and the concerns mm. I have. So yours is about quality? Yes, over quantity. Mm. Mm. Okay. And so you feel the, the free SHS, for example, is only looking at the quantity and not really the quality? I don't think the government has it in mind just to look at the quantity of, uh, of people, the number of people that are enrolling. But it looks like um, that's what it is now. Mm. You know, mm. they, they may have it in mind to give quality education to all these kids that are being enrolled in the school. But now, as it stands, it looks like the, 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 the quality is not being looked at. Okay. It's like everybody gets to pack your bags and let's go as compared to are they being given proper education in there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you. Clifford, you, you've listened to the two people, the, the lady and the gentleman. What's your own take? Um, well, my own take, uh, I do not think we are discussing pre SHS, but just a, a quick comment on it. Uh, pre SHS motive basically is to increase um, accessibility to mm -hmm. education, ensure that a critical mass of our population as a country gets a certain level of education um, that will ensure that it translates to having a lot more people who will not be liability to society, but will be access to society. And that critical to education in general. Mm. Every education that is deemed as quality education, if you look at the definition, it talks about the fact that a person have a certain average understanding and knowledge that will be able to contribute, and my emphasis here is contribute meaningfully to society and mm. a person becomes resourceful to its immediate environment. That's mm. essentially what um, quality education is mm. defined mm. for. Mm. However, if you ask me uh, what you asked earlier, uh, um, speakers, of education uh, in our time, um, 20, 30 years ago, and what it is today, whether there is some difference, I, would, I wouldn't say there is not, uh, I would say there isn't much significant change. Why? I'm speaking purely from the point of pedagogy. Mm. Uh, the teaching method um, hasn't changed enough. And therefore, mm. um, the issue should be looking at to improve quality of education and, and attainment of learning outcomes and okay. ensuring that we bridge the gap between academia and industry. Because often, we often will say the people we are training today are not fitting into industry. Yeah. And it's yeah. because we haven't looked at the issue of what are the needs of industry. Mm. And therefore, are the needs of industry inculcated into curriculum development, for example? And if it is inculcated into curriculum development, then it means that mm. um, what pedagogy, what teaching methodology are we using mm. to um, ensure that learning takes place, to ensure that we achieve the outcome, the set up objectives for the learning that we, we want to achieve, so that it puts the, the learner in a position that it will be able to deliver uh, when it gets to industry, and also be beneficial to society um, in general. Okay. So I, I want us to look at the issue of curriculum, mm. stakeholder engagement, and ensuring that industry people are always speaking to, um, to, to the development of curriculum 
and assessing the needs of the, the learners themselves so that mm. that can inform the teaching methodology we use to ensure that we achieve the set out objective, we must begin to move away from what we call in, in those as, as, as transmission model where the teacher is the it's a page on a page where he knows it all or she knows it all okay. and delivers what it is to the mm. students. Today, okay. just by the, by the handset, the device that the young people have in their hands, mm. they can't tell and Google or search on the information that is sent out by the teacher, whether it's accurate, whether it's appropriate or mm. otherwise. Okay. Therefore, it's incumbent on us as uh, people in education to ensure that mm. we... Mm. We engage the right pedagogy, okay. the right teaching method, mm. to ensure that the learners and also have a right assessment procedure. It's not just waiting to do a standardized assessment, okay, okay. and an um, interim assessment mm -hmm. or end of semester mm -hmm. assessment, mm -hmm. and or at the end of teaching that in, uh, of a particular uh, curriculum, mm -hmm. and then we do a wholesale standardized assessment, and then all we ask even in that assessment is things that dwell more on memorization. We don't ask questions that dwell on more on to test the analytical skills of the mm. students. Mm. We only ask questions that dwell more on comprehension. And okay. that's why people, we can find somebody in Asia 13 years, 12 years, right. 11 years, coding mm. uh, mm. things for aircraft, robotics, and here and there. Okay. And largely, our students or people who have even finished university education have degrees cannot contribute meaningfully to society. So you want us These to change? These problems are mm. as a result of mm. how we are teaching our students. It is more dwelling in the realm of acquired knowledge. Okay. We are not making them as critical thinkers. Mm. We are not engaging to think critically. Mm. We are not, the pedagogy is not pushing the issue of making them have critical mindset, okay. to have analytical skills, and to see how they can synthesize and apply whatever it is that they have learned. Okay, Clifford. So okay. That that, for me, should mm. be the, the, the crux of the matter. Okay. Um, for free SHS, yes, it has increased accessibility, mm. which is great to ensure that a larger population of our society mm. gets a certain level or threshold of education. Okay. But that kind of education, what do we want out of it? Whatever okay. we want out of it. All right. All right. Want, I'm, 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 I'm grateful, Clifford. So Clifford has really uh, told us what he, looked, he, he expects to see in, in education. So for, for him... He wants to see more practicality. Uh, Daniel Salome, I'll give you 30 seconds to tell us what you also expect to see. What do you want to see change in Ghana's educational sector? So, um, our constitution actually guarantees free education. But the same constitution it tells us that we must, we must commit to advancing the facilities that students use. Okay. We must make sure that our governments are committing to making these infrastructural changes. Mm. Because you cannot give free SHS when students cannot have space to be in. So infrastructure is a basic okay. thing. You understand that? All yeah. right. Uh, grateful. Uh, Ahima, don't, don't focus just on free education. Focus on the entire education uh, sector. What do you want to see change, Ahima, for you? 30 seconds. Right. So I, I, I wish the education system is never politicized. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be something that has to be changed with every change of government, because um, this is something that is dire and very delicate and sensitive. And so um, we are looking at um, better structures, better systems being put in place to, to help these um, um, students learn without it being distracted just because of politics. Mm. All right, Ohima uh, Ajay, I'm grateful to you. So Ohima uh, Ajay, the Daniel Salami, and earlier you heard Clifford Lajek uh, all telling us what, how they want to see Ghana's education sector, uh, you know, uh, going forward. So let's see. Uh, I hope that the authorities are listening and they will take some of these into consideration and help improve the educational sector of this country. Thank you for being a part of us today. There's more news and information on myjoyonline.com. Uh, it says, uh, Yebongura left ban on Jinapur, blesses him as grandson. That, that's one of the stories on myjoyonline.com. Again, CETA to call off strike. Uh, we are, we've resolved major issues. That's according to the employment minister, Ignatius Bafo Ewa. There is more on that uh, website. Go there and uh, grab a lot of the news and information. I'll leave you in the hands of LTS and then 
uh, you know, after that, we'll bring you a lot more here on this channel. Thank you for joining us. My name is Samuel Kojo Braze. On behalf of the team, I say thank you for spending your week with us. There's more that will bring you next week. Until then, please be good and have a wonderful weekend.